More often, we're hearing words like dementia and Alzheimer's creeping into conversations amongst groups of people that actually seem a little bit too young to be having these conversations, except for the fact that we actually need to be having these conversations. In 2012, the World Health Organization recognized dementia as a public health priority. It has significant social, medical, and economic implications with a total cost estimated at over $604 billion. Dr. Frank Knufel from Briere Memory Program is joining us today. So I want to welcome you to Living Your Life with Leanne Lang, the podcast brought to you by Extension Marketing. And for more information, you can always check out extensionmarketing.com. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. It's going to be a longer chat than we were used to on the show. Yeah. <laughs> I do want to um, just give people a little bit more of a bio because I, I find it fascinating the work that you've done. But you are a physician trained in the care of elderly, like with the extensive work um, and experience in uh, geriatric rehabilitation. Also, you have appointments as an assistant professor at the Department of uh, Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa, an adjunct professor in the Department of Systems and Computer Engineering at Carleton University. Uh, you're a clinical scientist at Briere for the Research Institute, and you previously held the roles of Chief of Staff, Vice President of Medical Affairs and Health Informa uh, Informatics. Is that right? Yep. Informatics. I'm going to ask you what that is. Um, so did I get most of it in there? That's, that's a lot of stuff I've done. <laughs> you have done so much. And I'm so uh, looking forward to this chat because while we think of these two words, um, for me, they, they scare me. Um, and yet it is affecting more and more of our population. It's a topic that needs to be discussed. Mm -hmm. for sure. Are we having the right discussion? Are people, do you feel that we're getting there? I think uh, we are starting to have the conversation. And events like this that uh, are great because uh, the more we have the conversation, the less the less frightened people will be and the more we can prepare for the future because I think that's really where the uh, the uh, benefits of having conversations like this are at. So you have a long list and an incredible bio and I wanted to know how you ended up you know with this line of work choosing this I mean like if you can take us back a little bit if you don't mind uh, usually there's a there's a pivotal turning point as to how people make these decisions? So th for me, it's been a long and, and sort of gradual uh, evolution uh, towards uh, uh, towards this uh, space. But uh, let me start by saying that uh, the first time I thought about medicine and about the human body and about how we function was in grade nine. And uh, there I, I was thinking about, um, you know, I was thinking about thinking, actually, and I was going, you know, how is it that I see the world the way I do? And and I said, well, it's the secret is the eyes, of course, because how I see the world is all about the eyes. So I thought, you know what? I, I went to the guidance counselor and I took out some pamphlets and I decided I was going to become an ophthalmologist, an eye specialist, because that would give me the sort of the understanding of how we think the way we do. This uh, is in grade nine. This is in grade okay. nine. And, it's, and of course, I was wrong because <laughs> the eyes are only one of the senses that, that feeds information to the brain. An important one, mind you, but it's it's really the, the lens that allows us to see the outside world, but it isn't the sole former of, of thought. But you're thinking, you're, you're sitting in class, and while some people are just daydreaming about, you know, skipping classes, you're thinking about the process of thinking. Like, you're thinking about how it is that you're thinking. That that's, was, it, it was a fleeting time. And uh, it, yes, but uh, uh, that's, that's where it started. And then, and then it sort of went away, really, if not went away, but I, then I had to go on with school. And so uh, when I went to, to Cégep, because I grew up in Quebec, and when I went to Cégep, I had to choose, do I do um, the health sciences or do I do uh, more of an engineering focus? My best marks were in math and physics, so that it seemed like uh, engineering was mm -hmm. a good place for me to go. Um, but I always had this nagging part of me that says, no, I'm really curious, though, about the human body and how we think. So um, I did actually a double um, sort of major in Seja, allowing sort of the opening into both directions. In the end, um, I did uh, end up obviously going into the health sciences and doing physiology, um, which is body systems, um, and uh, ended up doing my medicine and uh, then I felt where, I'd been in... Where did you... So you finished Sejap. Right. Where were you at Sejap? Like where... In I mean, Montreal. You were in Montreal. Yeah. 
where was the app where were the applications where did you see yourself fitting for med school so i went first i i realized they didn't have the marks to compete directly for med school i okay. did apply to mcgill but i knew it was a long shot so i did end up doing my undergrad at mcgill okay and then after three years, then I applied to medical school. And interestingly, it was my mom who said, you know, why are you only applying to English schools? And I said, well, because I've done most of my education in, in English. She goes, you know what? Why don't you just apply to the University of Montreal? It's in Montreal um, and you never know what will happen. You speak French. Uh, uh, I speak French now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, in grade seven, I did mm -hmm. French immersion. So my parents were proactive in, in helping get my French, uh, you know, to, as good as it could be because you know obviously i was living in quebec and i didn't know where i'd live in the future so um but then yeah and the only place i got accepted was at the university of montreal in french um so that was a whole other oh, challenge <laughs> so you're taking now so you've gotten into med school yep but you're now having to take these classes as in in a language that it's it's not like you spoke this language at home it's not like it's it comes easily to you so it's my third language because <laughs> your other's german is the background german right is my mother tongue and yeah oh okay so are you are you anxious about the material or just understanding the the language barrier doing this so fortunately <laughs> i had the undergraduate degree in physiology so i had a lot of the science basics in english so for the first year was really more translation it was was taking that knowledge now and, and converting it into uh, French. But my class had 180 students in it, and you can imagine what I felt like the first time I had to report back to the class. <laughs> that was <laughs> like, who is French. this guy? <laughs> like, yeah. It, were your peers surprised? Were they, I mean, so, I mean, the the Faculty of Medicine was very, very good, very, very welcoming. Um, some of my best friends for life are still the ones from that class. And so uh, we they, they accepted me right away. I was the German-English person in the class. Kid and in the uh, French medical class. And yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, Oktoberfest, they had me wear my lederhosen and play the accordion. So <laughs> they, they adopted the German side of me. But yeah, no, it was great. They really ad adopted me. And they were, yeah, I felt quite at home there, actually. Yeah, I, but I was anxious the first year um, in my, you know, sp my French speaking was obviously not to par, but but the education was you loved what you were learning. I was loved what I was learning. And and but after five years of medical school, I was tired and I decided, yeah, I was actually going to take the short exit, which is family medicine. And uh, so um, I, uh, I sort of went holistic. I said, you know, I like to understand life from from conception to to death and and family medicine will really give me that option to do the whole the whole story um, and it was actually in second year uh, when I was doing a rotation in geriatrics and, and care of the elderly um, that really changed me and it was a preceptor in Sherbrooke Quebec who um, who really changed my view of things and I, and that's the first time I said to myself actually I said look um, in all of the domains in in sort of the family medicine space, the one that's that's going to be the biggest challenge for the foreseeable future is going to be the care of the elderly. Our population is aging, and we just don't understand aging well enough. Um, and it's such a complicated field. I said, you know, this is where the biggest challenge is going to be. So I went back to, okay, what's going to be the most challenging thing? So that's sort of uh, in, the la in the second year Then I decided I'm going to do an extra year in training in care of the elderly, which I did here in Ottawa. How different is the, how different does the curriculum change then when you're looking at, you know, healthy, able-bodied, you know, creating life and, and ho having healthy life and then understanding that as healthy as you could have been in life, there will be this progression downwards. It, it for me, there's a, I don't want to say a sadness, but there is a sadness to it of, of, of where it's going. Yeah, I, I you know, I, uh, I was certainly at the beginning of medical school and at the beginning of family medicine, I sort of viewed um, the older adults as the ones that are sort of uh, um, slowing 
the whole process down and like I you know I wanted to see a lot of patients in the day and do a lot of exciting things in the older adults we had to speak more slowly it took longer to examine them and it seemed it was slowing me down so I certainly that's how I saw things at uh, the beginning but then once I did the care of the, uh, the the geriatrics rotation and once I decided I was going to do care of the elderly I sort of turned it around I said you know what the society that we have today was built by the former generations. We owe it to them to, to you know, to give them a, an end of life that's that's appropriate and as many years of, of quality of life as possible. And so, um, it's 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 a paradigm shift because it's not um, the sort of space where you know with healthy younger adults, you're going to have, uh, they come in with one problem. And sure, it can be one of, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different things that's causing that one problem. Um, but you, you dress it, if it's fixed, great, it's over. And, and then, then you move on. Um, in the elderly, it's, they've always, they start with 10 problems and come in with an additional problem. And that additional problem could be an exacerbation of one of the previous chronic 10. Um, or it could be actually a problem that was generated by medicine because we've given them too many pills and they're interacting, creating a new problem that they actually didn't have before, right? So um, the whole construct, the whole way of thinking about care of the elderly was so different. Um, and like I said, so much more intellectually stimulating mm -hmm. that uh, that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I had to do from then on. Okay, so it was a choice and it was a path and 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 I, it feels like you're incredibly passionate about it and almost like you're continually learning and you, there, there's there been progress. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I went out, came out of uh, my studies and then started doing uh, geriatrics and general geriatrics and um, rehabilitation was always a part of that because, um, you know, the older adult that has a hip fracture, they, they the hip gets fixed, but then they don't just get up and walk the next day. It, it, it requires a lot of time to get um, things back in tune if you like and that's rehabilitation and and it's a very positive part of care of the elderly when you you know you can take someone that that can barely get out of bed that that's confused and you know not doing too well altogether and then in a couple of weeks you can sort of turn them around getting them walking again getting them oriented again and cleaning up the medications and things it's it's super rewarding and so geriatric rehab was was a really important part of my life and to, to think about um you know how it's not always about fixing 100 percent, but it's taking what you have and making the best of that right and it's a different way of thinking about it like a pneumonia you you it, it has symptoms and you treat it and then afterwards there's no pneumonia it's gone right and that's that's great and that's sort of acute medicine um but on chronic care in in, in you know in the more uh, extensive conditions it's uh, um, you you sort of treat you add to the different components and you try to make the best with what you have because at that stage in life everything isn't 100 percent anymore you're working with 60 percent of this 70 percent of this and and i think it's an art at that point. i was going to say i feel like it's almost like you're playing with a puzzle yeah you exactly. know and then you you fit this piece you found this piece and then this one exactly. goes missing like and, and if you pull out the wrong yeah. one the house collapses <laughs> again right because it, that right. can happen so yeah it, it is really um it's a lot more sort of artistic uh which is good because of course music and and is a big part of my life and so i it's kind of neat that i've sort of found a space anyways i went to the from the yeah. rehabilitation side now i'm you know focused exclusively on on cognitive care care and and so I like to think of it in in the same way I um, you know at, at, at first when we thought about things like Alzheimer's disease we sort of thought well um, you know something just happened to the brain and then these things plaques and tangles have accumulated and and now we need to try and fix that um, and uh, that you know a lot of the research and a lot of the work is still going in that direction but over the years what we've discovered is that you know it didn't just happen you know on my 68th birthday that these plaques and tangles started appearing and when I'm 72 now I have a problem we know that they start accumulating probably in our 40s and 50s um, so that it's 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 both kind of disconcerting in one some ways but on the other hand it's also encouraging because it means that really we should start fixing things earlier and not wait you know um when we're 72 and then go oh now we have a problem let's fix it right so you know like right at the beginning of the podcast i mentioned these conversations are starting to happen earlier and earlier like younger groups are, are starting to mention these words in conversations if you don't mind because 
I don't want to say that these words are overused, but dementia um, is is different than Alzheimer's. And so I, are you able to differentiate so in this conversation people know what we're dealing with? Okay. And this is complicated always, and I spend a lot of time with patients and families trying to explain this. So let's start with dementia. Um, dementia is a chronic condition of the brain. It's a group of conditions of the brain, and it's sort of that late stage of decline where those changes affect our ability to do things, okay? So um, if, if we describe the whole trajectory, um, at the beginning, I might have the odd forgetfulness, and that's fine. I'm functioning fine. I forget this little bit of piece and of information. Doesn't really matter. Okay, then it okay. gets worse. Can I just ask something real quick? We, I can sometimes forget a phone number, or you forget someone's name, or you kind of blank out as going from A to B. Is are these the little things? These are little things, right? Okay. But they, they, if if that's all they are, then that's all they are. Like our brains, interestingly, um, are sort of at the top of their cell number, the neurons that make up our brain, there's 20 to 100 billion of them, It these sort of are at their maximum number at the age of 29. After that, it goes down. <laughs> so, so that's <laughs> so, why we, so many of us have a problem turning 30. Like there is a definite, there is, there is like there's something, something to on, it. Right? Okay. Right. Well, I mean, and think, wow. it, think okay. about it this way, right? Hockey players, yeah. right? They have their prime, right? And and so every organ, every part of our body sort of has its prime. And our the brain brains. cell number prime is 2930. Okay. There. After that, Gosh. the brain cells start dying off and the number goes down. However, we continue to learn. Right? We continue to learn and, and make connections between bits of information. So even though we're losing brain cells, we're still making connections. So, you know, when I was 29, I, I don't think I was as smart as I am now. Yeah. I don't see the world the same way, right? So we do continue to make connections. And so our optimal cognitive performance, we think, is somewhere between 45 and 55 years old. That's sort of when we're at our optimum. After that, the brain cells that are dying are actually starting to impact um, our, our cognitive abilities. Are there ways, and I will get back to this kind of this linear line that you're going on, but are there ways like from the 29 to the 40, like that we're able to do things to help sustain it as long as, so, as as healthy, able body, like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, does so, this come down to like healthy eating? Like, are there things that we can be doing? Right. So, I mean, so the brain is no different than any other part of our body, right? So there's just plain good old advice, which is going to help our brain. So eating well, it's going to help our brain, right? So I say carrots, right? You eat carrots, you can see the carrot, you can see what it's made of, and it's good stuff, and it's going to your body, it's going to your brain, it's going to feed your brain and do a good thing. Puts in. I love it, but it's kind of sloppy. It's kind of gooey. It's probably not the healthiest food there is. If I take that in and if that's going to my brain, what is it doing to my brain, right? So so eating is important. Um, sleeping is important, right? The brain needs rest. And so we should be sleeping somewhere between seven and nine hours a night, every night. And routine is good. So eating and sleeping, those your mom tried to teach you when you were a kid. And, you know, those are the basics to all of good health. After that, it's physical exercise, right? So well, physical exercise is actually the next most important thing you can do to your for your brain the healthier your body is the healthier your heart is the more it's going to be pumping oxygen to the brain right it's the heart is a pump the lungs are first the ones taking in oxygen so the lungs have to be healthy so hey smoking is that going to make my lung healthier probably not so is smoking going to be good for my brain probably not right so so healthy heart healthy lung we get that exercise is the best thing we can do so eating, sleeping, physical exercise, and then brain activities. The more brain activities we do, the more the brain is stimulated, right? So if I sit in front of the television, it's about as dumb as it can be because I'm just watching stuff on television. Now, there are some shows that are better than others <laughs> as far as, you know, if you want to follow along and, and beat, the, uh, the, beat the contestant at finding a word or whatever, sure. Um, but most of television is very passive, so it's not good for the brain. Doing stuff is good for the brain, right? Crosswords and, you know, Sudokus and puzzles and whatever. But, of course, we're not doing crosswords and Sudokus when we're 29. We're, we're doing a career. So 
learning another language, learning a new set of skills, uh, you know, keep di diverging out into new domains, do more challenging things, right? So every time you stimulate your brain in a different way, you're activating, and we can actually see that now with functional MRIs, we're activating different parts of the brain. And the more they get activated, the more they create blood vessels because they need more oxygen, the more the cells um, can make connections and, and get healthy and, and divide. And well, they don't divide, but I mean, they make connections. So um, cognitive activity. And then the next is social engagement. Social engagement is really important, right? Uh, the hockey player that goes into their basement, buys expensive equipment and does all the right exercises, but never leaves the basement, isn't gonna be that great a hockey player, right? You have to get out there on the ice, do it, look around, you know, interact with the other people, know how they're thinking about what you're doing because that's how you make a play, right? So um, in, the, in, in the real world, our brain is made to be social, to be connecting with other people. So those are really the top five, eat and sleep, physical exercise, brain exercise, and then social, social. engagement. I mean, these are these are critical components. So hopefully people have have kind of taken that and jotted it down. And then I'm going to take you back to where we were uh, uh, in the process. Then I'm sorry that I took you on a little bit of a, of a route there, but I, I I wanted to get sure. Why I was like feeding on that. Okay, sure. so we're so we're back, back into to, the, the, right. the progression so of happens, dementia. Right. Yeah. So what happens? So if we look at dementia and the definition of dementia. So again, let's look at normal aging first. Normal aging, we lose some brain cells, we lose a little bit of memory, a little bit of speed, and that's okay. Now, if we have more than that in a single domain, let's say in memory, our memory is now well below the average for our age and education, um, then we can start calling it mild cognitive impairment. Because now, if we test memory, it's really way, way low compared to a healthy person. As long as we're still functioning in society, though, that's okay. That's only mild cognitive impairment. It's when these memory or other cognitive domains affect our day-to-day -day living, that's when it's dementia. Okay, so dementia is the most severe form of brain impairment that affects our day-to-day -day living. Okay, so it's a continuum from normal aging to mild cognitive impairment to dementia. And then, of course, within dementia, you have early dementia, moderately advanced dementia, and then, of course, the most severe forms of dementia. So if you think of it as a continuum, right, dementia is the worst form because now it's affecting day-to-day -day living. And by the way, any chronic disease is the same thing. Arthritis, right, is a chronic disease of the joints. And I have arthritis, but I have very mild arthritis. In the morning, I can barely move my fingers, but by the by the middle of the day, everything is pretty flexible and it doesn't affect my typing ability or my ability to examine patients. So it's not affecting my day-to-day -day living. So it's mild. In the same way, you know, I might have a little bit of memory difficulty, but it's not affecting my performance, so that's mild cognitive impairment versus the dementia, and the dementia is when it affects day-to-day -day living. So think of that continuum. Now, if we look at what causes movement from normal aging to mild cognitive impairment to dementia, there are any number of things that can cause that. One of those is what we call Alzheimer's disease, right? And Alzheimer's disease is a description of a brain pathology. So it's something we see in the brain when we slice it up, right? And Can you see the dementia in the brain? We see the changes, the pathological changes. So we can say there are plaques and tangles in this brain more than what we would expect for that age. Okay. Okay. And then so this pathology, this damage um, is now one of the possible causes of why I've gone from normal aging to mild cognitive impairment or to dementia. So but that's a big one. It's very, very common, right? It's the most common cause of dementia. Um, but there are other ones like vascular dementia. So now think of your brain needs to be fed through the circulation. And if the circulation is partially blocked, then not enough oxygen is going to get to different parts of the brain. And what happens is the brain is going to suffer. The cells are going to suffer and die, right? So ultimately, the brain cell dying is going to be the cause of dementia. 
right? Because we've lost too many brain cells. And so the question is, what is the cause? And one of the causes is the Alzheimer's disease, that pathology. Another one is vascular changes. And then you've got all the other ones, Lewy body dementia um, and you know Parkinson's dementia and, all, and other ones. So. Okay. I didn't realize that there were that many different facets of it. So there's and so many different fall, things right. that can cause dementia, right? And Alzheimer's is simply one of the most common. One of the, you know, and, and this is this is hit close to close to home because a family friend had early onset uh, Alzheimer's, and so this is this is different than falling into the normal line of of aging. And you know, at fifty five years old, there were starting to see factors that were you know, forgetfulness, uh, you know, it, it was like a, oh my God, they're always, they're always late. <laughs> they're always forgetful. And then you look back and see what was happening. What is the percentage of people that you see with, with an early onset that they're getting this at a much younger age? Yeah. So at the, the burn memory program, we do get uh, the early onset uh, dementia patients. They get triage because we do have different types of physicians in our in our group and the cognitive neurologists are the ones that are the best at um you know dealing with early onset dementia because they can they, that's their specialty again my training was in care of the elderly mm-hmm. so i'm more likely to get um the the old rattles but yeah well if, in our population we do get 55 uh, 60s year olds and then they go to the cognitive neurologists is there is this Gen, uh, genetics like what what plays a role in in this disease right and and so the uh, <laughs> we don't actually have a clear picture and and that's part of the mystery of of, of dementia uh, so we we know that there is a very very small percentage of people with dementia that have sort of a genetic line where you know at 55 the father, develop dementia and then at 55 the daughter develops dementia and then their offspring at 55 develops dementia it's excessively rare um and so we don't even like it exists but we don't even talk about that the genetics is uh is still a bit of a mystery what we do know is more that uh, you might genetically be increased chance of getting dementia so what we usually tell families is that you may double your chances of getting dementia if you have a family member that uh, has a direct line family member. So if your parents or your siblings have dementia. But in the big picture, um, let's just pick a number. Like if we say at, you know, at 55, you have a one in eight chance of getting dementia in your lifetime. If you double that, it becomes one in four, which means that you're still three quarters of a chance of not getting dementia in your lifetime. So so there is a genetics component to it. We don't understand it very well at all, um, but uh, it, it's only a small component of it. So um, there are a lot of other factors that, that play, and, and that's a good thing because it means that there's a lot of things we can do to, again, to push out uh, this, uh, this condition. Uh, and then you talk about the things that you can do, because this is the research. This is what you are working on uh, at the Briere Memory Program. How important was the creation of this program? Because I think this is the game changer uh, as to what is happening there and the amount of people and who's coming in to use these programs. This podcast is brought to you by Extension Marketing. They are a new breed of marketing agency that acts as your virtual marketing department, designing and implementing cost-effective marketing strategies that will grow your business. I can speak to this personally as I've been using the extension marketing team to help me launch and grow my business. Founder Pat Whalen has been a lifesaver for me, a genuine coach guiding me along the way into uncharted territory. Tell them you're a friend of the show and receive a free one hour consultation. Check them out at extensionmarketing.com. Yeah, so I mean, we, so the Brewer Memory Program has existed for um, pretty much 20 years now. Uh, it started uh, a long time ago uh, by, by neurologists. And um, a, l- a lot of the focus early on was on the drug side of the house and looking to um, go, to, you know, to, to take part in drug trials, which are hugely important because uh, um, it is through science uh, to understand the brain better that, uh, that we uh, develop then techniques to try to uh, to s- stop the disease or, or at least slow it down so 
So first we have to understand the chemical process going on in the brain, um, and then we develop mod, you know, mod medications or compounds that can change this process in the brain. So that that's a really important part of the research. Um, uh, unfortunately, the last few years have been rather disappointing because uh, for the last 15 years, in fact, we haven't have found a single new compound that has really um, thought, done what we were hoping, which is, you know, sort of to be a game changer. We, we have so a number of leads. you had that in the first couple of years. In the was, first few years, we was... came up with a three medications and then a fourth we recycled a bit. Um, but yeah, that and that was sort of the, the turn of the century, if you like, the, the late 90s, the early 2000s. Um, but since then, there's really not been any any new uh, mo module that, or molecule that has been uh, commercialized. So there are a number of leads, though, where there's still work um, on the amyloid side and on the tau side. So, um, but we're still waiting for sort of the, the good news. Who's doing that? Who Who is, yeah. how many people around the world are trying to come up with this, this next big breakthrough? Right. So every year there's uh, several thousand people that get together at the International Alzheimer's Conference. So uh, in 2018, it was in Chicago. Uh, next year, it'll be in Los Angeles. So that gives you an idea, right? 2,000 people from around the world get together to, to talk about, you know, uh, where the research is at. Um, and so there, are, you know, there have been literally tens of billions of dollars spent on this kind of research uh, in the last 15 years. Um, so so, uh, but but drugs is only one dimension, of course, of the research okay. that, that gets done. Can I ask a question? As you're talking about the billions of, of dollars that have been put into this research, uh, the thousands of, of the most respected and the highest of this caliber going to these conferences, are we starting to hit almost, not yet like a panic button, as the baby boomers? I mean, you have the biggest influx of people heading into this category. Uh and who are brilliant and, and who have changed the direction of the world and, and creations that this group is is the critical one to get to um, and the largest. It's almost like a race against time, I would think. Yeah, exactly. And and, and I think the part of why the, there's so much momentum in this domain is because, because as you say, the boomers are, are coming. And so... Um, there is the the number of people with dementia. We think between twenty eighteen and twenty fifty uh, will double. Um, so think of you know the number of people there may be in your community in your family now, and then think that you know in, in by twenty fifty that will be double. So it it's it, it is uh, it is. A, a real serious issue because we need to figure out how we're going to care for these people because right now um, a lot of them end up in in nursing homes of course and uh, at the end of the disease and they you know already there are waiting lists in nursing homes across Canada um, and that's with you know a, a very small population where the you know the elderly population is you know somewhere between 12 and 17 percent of the population um, when that goes to one in four people then in that's going to be a whole other story we can't possibly build enough nursing homes to 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 take care of this so we have to find different ways of taking care of people that have dementia for sure i would think a lot of it is going to fall on the baby booners offspring to figure out how we are going to care for our parents uh, and care for them with you know, the fact that they have dementia, which will, which requires a lot more caregiving than just a, a, the natural progression of aging. Absolutely. I, the, the, you know, the 50-ish year old women are already are the sandwich generation. They're starting to take care of their elderly parents. Um, they still have children at home and as we know children are staying home longer um, taking longer to launch so it it is really uh, that that sort of 50-ish um, generation of women that that is is currently already the sandwich generation but that will certainly amplify over the next uh, 20 years so what is being what are some of the programs that that you're working on because i i want like there is work that's being done and there are things that are happening absolutely um so what what are you working on right now like what has what has evolved from rear 
So, so my passion is technology and aging. So um, remember a while back when we were talking, uh, I was sort of at one point sort of at the crossroads. Do I go into engineering? Do I go mm-hmm. into medicine? Of course, I ended up in medicine. But it's kind of interesting that now I've gone back to the engineering side of, of, of medicine, really. So I'm looking at how technology um, can help us with this um, dementia challenge, really. Um, and so when you think about you know, sort of the cycle of, you know, uh, caring for people dementia, you know, the first thing is to diagnose, right? The first thing is we, we need to be able to say, you know, is this person having plain old normal aging? Do they have mild cognitive impairment? Or is this early dementia? Right. And because each one of those has a different story and a different set of conditions. So the first thing is we need to um, think about uh, diagnosing better. So, you know, we can and we have built more and more expensive machines, functional MRIs, now PET scans that can identify amyloid on the brain already when we're 40. Um, and so these are, you know, multi million dollar machines and and you know, potentially uh, can make a big difference in diagnosis. But if we think about it, if we want to x-ray every 40-year-old and look for amyloid on their brain, uh, that will bankrupt the healthcare system before we even start to think about caring for them afterwards, right? So, So we really have to think about how we do this. So can we use technology um, and come up with a cheaper but as effective methodology. So one of the things we're doing is looking at EEG. EEG is old, old, old technology that's existed since the 60s. And, um, you know, now we have ways of taking that information and looking at um, uh, the electricity in the brain as a means of measuring our, our brain's ability. So we know that somewhere between when brain cells are dying and us actually forgetting how to tie a shoelace, for instance, there's something in the in the brain that we're missing. And, and, and electricity is certainly a big component of that because it's the circuits in the brain that, that are so important. So, so there is a thing where maybe we can use EEG, which is a very cheap technology, um, to, to identify early changes in the brain. With computers, we have a whole other set of tools now where um, using simply the way we interact with the computer, the way we play games, for instance, can tell us about how our brain is working. And so um, the idea of you know using, um, for instance, a card sorting game um, to help th- diagnose early dementia would be uh, you know a, a huge uh, breakthrough. And it's again a project that, that we're running at uh, Bria right now. So so that's sort of on the diagnosis side. Then there's sort of um, on the intervention side, right? So early on, um, you know, we've talked about, you know, the physical exercise, the cognitive exercise, and the social engagement. On the cognitive side, uh, what if we could develop brain training exercises that using what we've all the skills and all the things we've put into computers to make them so smart, maybe we can now use that computer to make us smarter, to help us uh, maintain our cognition. And there's certainly an, uh, some products out there already which have shown huge promise in, in brain training uh, activity. So if we can use technology for early identification and we can use technology for early intervention, if we, if we could just push out by... Um, one year, the onset of dementia, we'd be going back 10 years in the population that we have right now. And, and that would make such a huge difference. Just the one year, even pushing one, it out one, one year, year brings us back to where we were 10 years ago, as far as numbers mm-hmm. and the population. So uh, imagine if we could push it out five or 10 years, um, we could, we could prevent that need to, to build, you know, twice as many nursing homes and, and that, that, that if we think of the way we care right, right. now. So like I, I'm thinking if you're talking about these these programs like brain quests or or is it a certain a certain type of a program that will well, initiate or target a certain part of the brain um, exercises, right. you know, because so, you, you can do your Sudokos and your crosswords, but guy you know you've already talked about exercise and eating healthy it's it's hard enough getting people to do those things how hard is it going to get them to sit and not look at the television but do these <laughs> brain games I, like so people will always be people and we will like, always find the root of least resistance right so um it, however um it just requires a small scare usually yeah and then that that 
that's the turns trigger. us around, right? So, um, right. So just to go back, there there is a lot of research right now, um, a lot of controversial research right now about brain training and the impacts of it. And uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, studying it. And so there there is right now really only one product that i endorse to to my patients and that's uh, brain hq which is offered on dynamicbrain.ca the the website in canada and there is now 15 years of evidence mm-hmm. that this makes a difference so some of the studies have shown for instance that um, obviously early on they if you train memory your memory will be better than someone who didn't train their memory. That's sort of like mm-hmm. if I lift weights, I'm, my arm is going to be yeah. stronger than someone who doesn't lift weights. But so what, right? Um, what happens, you know, five years out, ten years out, and and now and now that the, the research is 15 years old, now we've shown that after 10 years, they have shown after 10 years that um, these people still have better memories than their than their their counterparts but more importantly they're living more independently so they're more likely to still be going to the bank they're more likely doing their own shopping doing their own activities making their own meals and they're less likely to have dementia so this is the first time that we've shown playing computer games can actually delay the onset of dementia or reduce the chances of getting dementia. So I think that's pretty exciting. Right. But why did you mention there's a controversy? So the controversy is, is that there's a, there's studies that have been shown not to make any difference, right? So there are, and, and part of it is we have to figure out how to design these studies properly, right? So, um, if you do it, if you do a drug intervention trial, it Mm -hmm. typically lasts six months and then we hope to show a difference at the end of a year. Right, because that's that that costs a billion dollars to do that, <laughs> just that study. Um, Did so you, say you a can imagine, dollars? yeah, from from the time you develop yeah. the molecule and yeah. you try it in rats or mice, and then you bring it to people and you do a small amount of group of people to make sure it's safe, and then to bring it to a trial that lasts a year, by then you've spent a billion dollars. So, so if you if you think about that, right, to do a fifteen year study, it's it's impossible, right? So. However, when you think about doing brain training and, and, and when you think about how complicated the brain is and the different areas of the brain do such different things, but they all have to interact together to make you be the person you are, right? Because it's not, it's not only my language center that's working right now. I have, you know, I have to have all kinds of mm-hmm. other things working at the same time, my memory and, and my thinking part of my brain. So they all have to work together for us to have this conversation. So, um, so if we train only memory, a tiny little thing, and we say, okay, we're going to learn three words, then four words, then five words, is that going to make me a better physician? That's a stretch. And how would you possibly measure that? So the chances of us getting that kind of information from a single intervention is, is first of all, very hard. Um, and then it's going to take a very long time to prove it. And so that's that's where the challenge has been, is that the studies aren't long enough. They're, they're trying to measure too many different things. Um, and so so that's why there's a controversy there, there there's a lot of studies that have failed right and 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 there have been companies that have been sued because they said that their product helps train the brain and and prevents dementia and they don't have the evidence and they've been sued and had to pay million dollar fines so that's why i say there's mm-hmm. a controversy can you repeat the one that you that you endorse that the which is the one that you are giving it and telling your patients to to use so brain hq is the uh, american name mm-hmm. but uh, the canadian website is dynamicbrain.ca and it's easy to remember because you want to have a dynamic brain uh, and keep it your brain dynamic so and do people have access like once you get to this website it's anyone can log on anytime and i tell people just look at it go to the bottom of the, the screen where it says free trial and and try a couple of them if it engages you great if it doesn't well then there's no point right so it it's like anything um, I sort of give the example, you know, there are people who exercise by themselves. So I'm that mm-hmm. guy. Yeah. I, I wake up early in the morning. I go into the basement. I do my exercise. I don't like to be disturbed. I'm I'm a solo exerciser because I spend my day with people and the rest of the <laughs> day. Weren't. Other people are group exercises. Like they don't have the thing. With, they, they don't go into the basement to exercise. They'd rather go to a class of 24 people in Zumba and that's their thing, right? So they get stimulated by other people. So great. So there is no one perfect solution. Um, but 
that. So, so you know, if some people might be a group thing where mm -hmm. brain training might be, be more easy in a group setting, right? But, but this is the best product that we have right now. For people who are wanting to get in, is it, oh, when you're talking about the numbers now, is it a long time to get into testing? Is it a long time to get in and see someone or be a part of these programs? Like what? At where you're talking about specifically? Yeah, like at this point, what constitutes you getting in over someone else when you've got one parent who's forgetful, one parent whose personality is changing? Because we haven't even mentioned too, like with this, there's aggression, there's anger, uh, there's a lot of emotional aspects to this that it's not just being forgetful. So I, I want to emphasize that the very first thing you should always do is see your family physician because the family physician can help you start the process of sorting out, you know, is this normal? Is this just an environmental thing that's going on? They, they just went through a difficult move and one of their children is sick or whatever. So all kinds of stress can impact your ability to think. So I always say, go see your family doctor first and just, just explore with them your concerns. And then they become the filter, the triage, the first point of triage. If they're concerned, and some family physicians are very comfortable using first-line medications for, for the treatment of dementia, then by all means, stay with them, right? Not everyone needs to come to Briere. If you have, you know, some family physicians don't aren't as comfortable, so they refer on to us. Um, as soon as it's more complicated or it's not responding the way we'd like, of course, then a specialty clinic like uh, Briere uh, is the appropriate place to go. And more importantly, if you're if you're interested in helping us to find the solutions of the future, um, you know, then ask your family physician to 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 connect with the Briere Research Institute um, because we're always recruiting uh, people to be part of our trials. Right. Um, so so even if you are relatively healthy, but you're worried about your brain aging, we need people like that, too, that are healthy right now mm -hmm. so we can compare them to the other one so we always need controls and 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 we do longitudinal trials where we look over time how does the brain change how does the electricity in the brain change how does our ability to play games change right and all of that helps us to again uh, be better clinicians uh, well and we talk about how many things can affect i mean trauma uh, PTSD, like there are so many factors that affect like the chemical, like makeup of the brain that, that there's, there's factors that change what happens. Absolutely. Like, there's so many, so many things that can happen. Like you say, external factors, infections of the brain obviously can, can be tragic. So yeah, there's so many factors uh, that, 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 that play into this, uh, this fragile organ. On a daily basis, you know, when you when you look at what your days are like, are, is there? Do you feel like you're making a difference? For like, where is the, where is where are you a difference maker at, at this point? Because it's in you're in such a difficult right. line of work. So so the way I look at it is uh, in in sort of two ways. The first is. I hope I make a difference for the future generations. That's why I do research. That's why I'm looking at technology. That's why we're running trials right now in the community to see, you know, can we develop tools that can help people that are caring for people with dementia? Um, so that, there's that, which is future oriented to, to make care of the future better. So that that's one thing I wake up every day feeling good about. The second is for the current people, um, this is a frightening thing. And, and I hope that when they come to see me, I become like the tour guide. We're going on a trip together. Um, this may not be the trip that you thought your retirement was going to look like, but if you have an experienced tour guide, hopefully I can make that uh, trip as good as it can be given the limitations of what we can do today, right? So it, that's how I hope to to make a difference every day at every time I see a patient at the clinic is that look I'm I'm hopefully helping there's always things we can do right we can decrease some you know if there's depression we can decrease the depression um, if there's behavior changes we can suggest ways of uh, adapting to those and and of course 
the people with dementia, that the people that are caring for them also react in different ways. And if we can adapt that, then there's less tension and, and, and things improve. Sleep is really important, right? So people with dementia, after a while, they lose sort of their day-night cycle and then they start wandering at night. And of course, that affects the, the caregiver because now the, all day they take care of this person, but now at night they don't even get to sleep because they're worried about this person, uh, you know, walking, potentially walking out of the house in the middle of winter. Um, so we're doing research on technology for that right now as well. Yeah, I was thinking, it's funny because when I was in my 10 years of lack of sleep uh, on the morning show, um, I would listen to how sleep was important. And, and I would, I honestly, I would forget the most basic things just, and I would often just blame it on exhaustion. Like I just, have I damaged, like, are, have, are we doing damage in our youth that is affecting things or am I able now that I'm caught back up on sleep, am I, like, I can't get those blood, you know, like you said, we were losing the, the, the brain cells at the age of 29 on. Like, yeah. can I, can I look at this in a positive way and, and the next generations that we can do things? Absolutely. The way, the way I look at it is, you know, we have all of our lives to develop our brains in the best possible way. And the sooner we start, the better. So for instance, uh, any educators that are listening to this, right, I can only highly recommend that we keep phys ed programs in schools and don't go, well, because the, you know, the curriculum is getting more and more packed with learning, we can't, we have to take out phys ed. No, we need that running around to circulate the blood to our brain, even when we're children, right? So, so for sure, we can always do better things. Look, life is real. We have to make choices. We need to have a job. We need to pay the mortgage. We, we raise children. We, all these things are factors. We can't have the perfect brain life. We'd have to virtually be in a bubble. And we just said, you can't be in a bubble because you're not having the social connection. So we can't do the perfect brain planning. We can't develop the perfect brain. Mm -hmm. But with we can always do a little better and if we do think of it that way like what could I do better what can I adjust ever so slightly so right now I'm 55 I never exercise this is not me by the way I exercise every day I have to practice what I preach but I'm saying if someone is thinking right now I'm 55 I'm not doing any exercise so because I'm so busy with work mm -hmm. and the kids and whatever yes it's true but there's absolutely really no reason you can't spend a half hour a day doing exercise there isn't at the end of the day if it's if it's a priority if it's enough of a priority start start tomorrow uh, you mentioned the phys ed and I was I wanted to ask you about the arts because music and you had mentioned music and I don't know if it's through Hollywood and through movies and you kind of get this idea but certain triggers um, music being one of them is there is there something to that as well Look, music is, is for me, a, a big mystery. I mean, I'm a musician. I, I, I love music. It's it's so good for the soul. Um, how it works exactly, we we don't know. What we do know, though, is uh, that, as you said, you know, there are people with severe dementia that can't speak two words, connect two words to, to communicate what they're saying. If you put uh, earbuds on or earphones on and listen to old music that they grew up with, all of a sudden they start singing the music, the words are perfect. And it's like, um, but then when you turn the music off, it's gone again, unfortunately. So, so we do know that music lights up a part of the brain that is, is sort of connected to language, is connected to memory. But it has its own beat, if you like. And, mm -hmm. and we, we, there's a lot of research actually looking at um, not just music, but uh, meditation, mm -hmm. um, mindfulness, uh, um, all that uh, kind of thing. And, and it sort of goes back to the sleep, right? We do need to give our brain rest. We can't have the brain on, you know, 24 hours a day. It, it will burn out because it, it needs to sort of regroup. And, and that is what happens when we sleep. And that and, and that is part of what's going on when we dream. The brain is sort of sorting information, trying to file things so that by the time we wake up the next day, um, we're on again and, and, and we can work. But, uh, but uh, um, we know that, you know, this is a method of torture to keep people up 24 hours a day and not be able to sleep, right? Because you're, you're burning out the brain. Sleep, exercise. Diet. Diet. Games, cognitive, cognitive exercise. exercises, social interaction. Those are the top five things 
right there. Uh, people can find more information uh, about the memory program. Uh, is there a, is there a wait list? Like, I mean, so we uh, realistically, right. if you can. So good news. We mm-hmm. just recruited another cognitive neurologist in September, um, and uh, it, it's been fantastic. Our wait list is down to just a few weeks right now. Now, it will build up again, mm-hmm. uh, but we continue to look at recruiting. So right now is actually a great time to be referred to the Brera Memory Program because you'll get in, you'll, you'll have seen a physician probably within two months. Uh, and average age right now that you're... That you'd be seeing. So we see a few people in their 50s, uh, a few more in their 60s, a lot of people in their 70s, and a lot of people in their 80s, few in their 90s, right? So yeah. that's the curve. That's sort of the shape of, of who we see. The, the largest majority is in their 70s and 80s. But when you have someone coming in in their 50s, um, can they usually walk out of the office feeling, okay, like I maybe they were being proactive or or usually there's something... Look, I would, I, you that know, that made them make that call. Sure. So there's always something that makes you consult your family doctor in the first place, and then there's something that makes that family physician decide they want to refer on. So, um, uh, the younger the people, the harder it is to diagnose, right? And and that's why we have the cognitive neurologists on our team. But uh, you know, n- there are good appointments, right? There are people that come in and that are worried that have you know, that have problems with memory, but if they get onto the right change of their lives quickly enough, they do get better. So a lot of my patients either stay the same and we're able to which maintain is, them. Which is good. Which is a great for outcome, you, right? For you, staying the same and, and not going downhill yeah, is, is a massive right. win. Sure. And um, and some people, we, we slow down the process. And again, just like I said, if we, you know, if it's, this is this is a 10-year disease, right? We're talking from the moment that the first symptoms become really obvious to to the end of life. That's a 10-year disease. So if we can add a year or two to that, that's huge, right? That That's a game changer. I mean, yeah, think you're of wanting all the to add that, that one or two years. years at the beginning rather than the one or two years we want to towards push it out. the end, yeah, right? Because to, that's that's just the, two the, more years of diff, like of no, heartbreaking yeah, right. way we of living. Push, we want to push, exactly, at the beginning. Mm-hmm. The more we can push out or extend the the good years of higher functioning, the better it is. And you're still uh, pro, there are medications. I mean, you're still turning back to the ones that were created 15 years ago. We're that still are using they're, them they're and still... they still give us, you know, moderately good results. So for sure, we'll continue using the, the, the best there is um, and, and follow the Canadian guidelines. And we help make those guidelines, of course. But the, the next big conference is in LA, as you mentioned, Chicago, and then the next one's in LA. Is there always that anticipation anticipation that it's right around the corner? Like, of course, we well, we so we first of all, we've submitted some of our work to the uh, LA mm-hmm. conference, which is always exciting, and we hope that you know someone will want to hear about what we're doing. So that's part of it. But of course, we're always going as well to know you know what's uh, what's the state of the art, where are the most hopeful um, changes, and 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 then how can we adapt our practice so that we are always at you know the, at the best uh, that, that we can be. And you talk about the work that you're doing at the universities. Do you enjoy speaking with young students knowing that they might be the game changers in in all of this? Well, that's exactly what uh, academic work is about, right, is is, uh, we supervise trainees in medicine, so be they residents in family medicine or neurology or or psychiatry, or um, they they come to the clinic. And so it's important for them to, to... Think about the brain or learn from us the way we think about the brain, if you like. So that's that's really important. But I also love working with engineering students because they've sort of come out of, you know, numbers and algorithms and and helping them transition into the real world and and transition into a real world problem, um, I think, is just Mm -hmm. as important because it's not just I don't want to just educate physicians. I want everyone to know. And and there comes the engineering at at Carleton University. I think it's fascinating. You know, you've got all of these job creations that didn't exist, you know, 15, 20 years ago, like gaming as a class. But these gamings isn't just for kids playing Nintendo or PlayStation or on their phones. This, these are going to be gamings that are going to change uh, medicine uh, at the same time. So it really is quite fascinating. People can find more information at Briere. Uh, so website for Briere, 
for the is it separate for the memory program or just if you're heading to it, well go to the Breer website yeah. there is the Breer Research Institute that that has its own connection from there um, and then from there there's all kinds of different research projects that that you can connect to uh, um, our website is Taffeta dot ca so t-a-f-e-t-a dot ca um, and uh, so if you want to connect uh, with us uh, learn more about the research we're doing uh, you can send us an email or call and uh, um, if you want help out because right now you're applying for a 50 million dollar grant <laughs> so if you have any in on that that would be fantastic and then we can get a jump start on all of this but i really appreciate your time um and and kind of eye-opening and i think for a lot of people um kind of understanding where they're at and, and knowing where their family members are at but also their own care uh those five factors are i think are going to be a critical component thank you so much for joining us that is a wrap on uh, this episode of living your life with leanne lang and once again i should have mentioned right at the beginning so for those um, um, we have now moved to Spotify and on uh, Stitcher. So we have continued to grow this podcast and the platforms that you're able to uh, be able to listen or watch on. Uh, and a reminder, please, if you can like and share, let people know uh, about the podcast and all of the amazing guests that uh, we've had on so far. And that's a wrap. Have a great day. <laughs>